Hi, so I'm uh, Drew Festini. Um, is audio okay? All right. Um, so I want to talk today about uh, Linux on open source hardware in Libre Silicon. Um, I'm part of the BeagleBoater.org Foundation. Um, and there's a lot of links in these slides. Um, so if you want to, you can go to my Twitter right there, which is PDP7 right now, and there's a link uh, pinned at the top. Or if you can read at the top, there's a link to the, uh, the PDF. So there's a bunch of links in these slides. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I work as an open source hardware designer for a PCB manufacturing service in the U.S. known as Oshpark. We're probably most notably, probably most well known for having a purple solder mask. So if you ever see purple circuit boards, we've probably made them, like the little tucks here. Um, also a volunteer uh, as part of uh, the board of directors for the Beagle Border Dork Foundation. Um, these are my different contacts for these different things. The other thing is I uh, uh, volunteer as part of the board of directors for the Open Source Hardware Association, um, currently serving as the vice president. And I'll go into all these more during the talk. So I included this for people that come to the slides that weren't here. Um, but examples, you know, we're all familiar with open source software. Um, so I'm using this to frame what I'm going to talk about in terms of hardware. Um, and coming from the open source definition, um, it was important that you can modify and share um, and that design is publicly accessible um, and that with open source software you can inspect, modify, and enhance. Um, and then kind of talk a little bit about, usually I talk a little bit about free software. I think we're all probably fr pretty familiar with that. And, and when it comes to open source hardware, um, I like to conflate all these things into uh, one term. So, you know, we have this term called FLOSS, which is free, labor, and open source software. We try and combine both the free software and the open source software worlds together under that term. Um, so when it comes to open hardware, free hardware, there's different, some people use different terms like free hardware, Libre hardware, open hardware. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use the term open source hardware. And to me, I consider all those to be equivalent. So um, open source hardware is hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on the design. Um, so I mostly do electronics. So for electronics, that would be the documentation required would be the schematics, the board layout, and the bill of materials or the parts list. Um, and when we're talking about the, what you would share for an open source hardware project, it would be the design files, uh, the editable design files for the CAD software that you're using. Um, like if you're using KiCad or Eagle, you would share those files. Um, not just the PDF uh, or not just um, uh, the Gerbers, you would share the editable design files. Um, and one of the best practices when it comes to your bill of materials or your parts list is to make sure that the components are available in distributors from low quantity. Um, so one of the Probably most popular examples of an open source hardware board is the Arduino. Probably most people here have heard of the Arduino. It's a microcontroller board. Um, and one of the reasons why Arduino is well known, it was created at a small school in Italy. Um, and probably no one would have made, known of it otherwise, uh, but they shared it as an open source hardware design. And at the time, it had enough features um, that uh, it caught on and achieved critical mass. Um, there's an interesting documentary about the original Arduino team that I linked there into the slides. So this is an example of because they released it as open source, it was able to achieve critical mass and become kind of the quintessential microcontroller board for a lot of people when they're getting started. In the case of the Arduino Uno, which is one of the most popular um, Arduino boards, um, you can go to the website there and you can download the um, design files in Eagle, um, which is the software they used to create it. Um, real quick, I don't know, I'll probably get to it later on as well, but one of the things with open source hardware um, is that you don't have to use free software or open source software to create the design files for your hardware. Um, ideally, best practice would be that you would use free software or open source software um, design programs to do it. Um, but for some things, over time, there's not been available um, uh, free software alternatives. So. Um, in this case, it is an Eagle, which is a proprietary program, but they are sharing the design files, so that's considered to be an open source hardware project. So um, what makes it open source? Well, the fact that you're releasing the design files to your hardware under an open source license. Um, so there's 
several different options when it comes to that. Um, there's the Creative Commons um, suite of licenses. Um, one thing to keep in, keep in, uh, keep in mind is that the non-commercial clause is not acceptable. So the non-commercial clause is uh, antithetical with the open source definition. The open source definition says, uh, the original OSI open source definition says that you can't prescribe the use of um, the, uh, the code or the, the design that you're releasing. So um, common thing you'd see is a Creative Commons uh, attribution, share alike. Um, or you might want to use a copyleft license like the GPL v2 or v3 or a permissive license like Apache, BSD, MIT. Um, but those are kind of what, from a software background, there are open, there are hardware specific licenses that have caught on. So CERN created one called the Open Hardware License, which I particularly like. Um, there's also another one called Tapper, and there's another one called SolderPad. Um, so this can get uh, kind of confusing. I'm gonna focus on the, op the CERN Open Hardware License because I think it's one of the better ones for doing um, open source hardware projects. Um, so CERN, the physics lab uh, here in Europe, um, they, they uh, started off with this thing called the Open Hardware Repository. So they wanted to be able to share all the different hardware they, they were creating for their experiments and share them with different labs around the world. Um, so with the CERN OHL, um, the, the point of it is any designer wishing to share their design information uh, using a license compliant with the open source hardware um, definition. So um, there's this version, uh, the 1.2, they're just coming out now with a 2.0 version. Um, and one of the people at CERN that helped create the license uh, says their idea was supposed to be equivalent to the GPL. Um, and they, the, the theme of it is that you should be able to see the source, study it, and modify it. Um, in, the, in the case of hardware, we're talking about the design documentation. Uh, Javier Serrano is one of the people that runs the open hardware group at CERN um, and he gave it, there's a really good interview with him. So if you want to learn more about the history of um, the open hardware uh, repository and the group there at CERN, um, they were kind of one of the leaders in this uh, open hardware scene. Um, great interview with him at that link. So it can get very confusing with licensing and not just licensing but copyrights and patents and trademarks. There was a really good talk at the Open Hardware Summit a few years ago that reviewed different open hardware licenses. So depending on what you're doing, um, some have advantages and disadvantages. So I highly recommend checking out that talk. So what's the point of all this? Um, so to me, the thing that I like to say um, when we're talking about open source and open source hardware is to me the main reason to do it is that you want to enable collaborative development. Um, that you want other people to help contribute to your project. Um, I think we're all familiar with that with software. The idea with open source hardware is that you want other people to contribute and collaborate on your hardware design. Um, and you know, the goal is not just to be able to say that you're you know, open hardware project or an open source hardware project. You, know. you should really be doing it because you want to do uh, collaborative development with other people from the community. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, I'm part of the Open Source Hardware Association. So we're uh, a nonprofit based in the US um, and we host the Open Source Hardware Definition. Um, and uh, this all kind of came about back in 2010. We had the first um, Open Source Hardware Summit um, and kind of just came together as a community of people that were interested in doing hardware at the time and sharing their designs and, and came up with a definition of what we thought that meant. And that's hosted at the Oshawa website. We also have things like best practices for people that want to do open source hardware, quick reference guide, um, things that uh, you may do and that you must do for to meet the definition. So one of my favorite events uh, is the Open Hardware Summit, which has been going on since 2010. So if you have any, if you have any interest in uh, open source hardware, open hardware community, um, there's been a bunch of talks over the years. Uh, most of them have been recorded. And then in uh, March of 2020, we're going to be having our 10th uh, Open Hardware Summit in uh, New York City. And actually, next month, October, uh, we consider that Open Hardware Month. So what we're trying to do is get people around the world to organize open hardware, open source hardware themed events in their local cities. So if you check out this website, ohm.ashwa.org, 
Um, you can check out to see if there's anything going on uh, where you're located. Um, and if there's not, uh, maybe maybe get together with some friends and and uh, set, uh, set up a meetup. So it could be something like a meetup, um, a cocktail thing. I do a thing called Hardware Happy Hour in, in Berlin, along with a couple other people. Um, so it could be something like that. It could be a workshop, um, or it could be uh, get some people together to do like lightning talks. Um, we have some advice on there about running events. So the, the idea is to get people together and talk about ideas around open source hardware. And as I was mentioning with the Open Hardware Summit, all the videos from the past summits are online. So if you're interested in, in learning more about it, like one of the main reasons I, one of, the, one, of the way, one of the main ways that I learned about Embedded Linux was watching all the ELC videos from over the years. So if you're interested in learning more about open hardware, recommend checking out the, uh, the talks from the past summits. And I have links in there for that. Um, so one of the things uh, as the Open, Open Source Hardware Association that we wanted to do over the last couple of years was come up with a way for people to say that your project is a uh, certified open source hardware project. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but there's, I had in the first slide there, there's this gear logo that a lot of people have been using. Um, it's a fun logo. Uh, I, I like it a lot, but it doesn't have any like sort of legal meaning. Um, so we created this as a program for people to be able to self-certify that their hardware project is open source hardware. Uh, and then they get this logo in a, in a ID number. And the nice thing about it is um, if you're a user looking for a hardware project and you see that, then you know that uh, it's an open source hardware project and you can also go look it up in the certification database and find links to the design files, find links to the documentation. So it kind of simplifies being able to identify if a project is open source hardware. So there was also once a open hardware summit here in Europe, in Vienna. Um, and I, when I was at the, the hacker camp in Germany uh, last month, the chaos camp, um, there were some people that were interested in doing one uh, in 2020 here in Europe. So if you are interested in maybe getting involved, um, shoot me an email. I have my email there, drew at pdp7.com. Um, so it would be nice to, I think, have an event in Europe since it's going to be in New York next year. More information about the Open Source Hardware Association. We have a mailing list, we have a forum, we have Twitter. Um, and our executive director wrote a book about building open source hardware. That's a collection of essays from different people um, that have built hardware projects. So that's worth checking out if you want to learn more about kind of the background and some use cases of people uh, creating open source hardware and how it worked for them. So what I really wanted to talk about here today was Linux on open source hardware because they're my two favorite things. Uh, so one of, the, one, of, one, of, one of my favorite examples is the Novena laptop. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this, but this is from a few years ago. Um, so really awesome engineer, Bunny, uh, and uh, Sean, he goes by Zobs, uh, created this uh, completely open source hardware laptop. And at the time, it was pretty decent. It had a quad core um, uh, IMX6, um, and also had FPGA in it, and a software defined radio. Um, so this was, I think, a really cool project. They, they decided they wanted to make a laptop that fit what they needed for, for what they do, which is mostly like reverse engineering and hardware hacking. So they created a completely open laptop. Um, this was really cool at the time. I don't think they're going to do a follow-up. So um, kind of one of the things I want to break up in my talk is kind of like what's the next generation of open source hardware that Linux can run on will look like. <clears throat> so, one of the other things I am involved with as a volunteer is BeagleBoard.org Foundation, um, and we design open hardware computers uh, for makers, educators, and professionals, so it kind of, there's a broad range there of people using the boards, um, and the designs get created by us in the foundation, working with people in the community, and also different manufacturers. Um, and this all goes back to 2008. Um, the Beagle board was one of the first low-cost ARM development boards. Um, and then that was followed up with the smaller one, the, the BeagleBone in 2011. And then the BeagleBone Black in 2013. Um, and because it's open source hardware, there's actually kind of a whole, um, whole bunch of variations with different 
um, feature sets and price points from different manufacturers. So um, just to give you a, a little look there, there's, there's several different companies making Beagle Bones with different features and different feature sets. Um, you know, kind of, kind of the nice size of it being open, open hardware is like, you know, Seed Studio is like, oh, we, we don't want to, we think we can get rid of HDMI and save some money. So they made one that was a little bit cheaper called the Beagle Bone Green. Um, so it's nice to see comp manufacturers optimizing the, the features for different price points. Um, and then one of the things that was quite interesting uh, from a few years ago was there was a company called Octavo in uh, a startup in Texas that took all the ICs that were in the original BeagleBone and put them into one big BGA package. Um, the nice thing about this is it really simplifies the PCB layout. Um, so the first one that we made using this was the BeagleBone Black Wireless, um, which was designed uh, in Eagle, and it really simplifies the design. Um, so like, for example, here, this is the BeagleBone Blue meant for robotics. So it's a pretty, co pretty complex board, but that system and package really simplifies the board design and makes it only a four layer board. So with these designs being open source hardware, we want people to take the designs and modify them and use them for different use cases. Um, but like the original Beagle board and the BeagleBone Black are actually pretty complex designs. The nice thing about this system and package, it makes the the circuit board design much less complex. So we have uh, the pocket beagle, which is actually only a four layer PCB. Um, and uh, it's available in both Eagle and KeyCAD. So you can actually take this, the design's available in free software. You can take this and make your own version of a uh, Linux computer. So um, you can use free software to uh, make your own uh, Linux computer. So one example of that is um, uh, Kamar Abishak um, took the design of the Pocket Beagle and he wanted to make a logic analyzer. Um, so he created the Beagle Logic, which is a 14 channel, 100 mega sample logic analyzer that's based on the uh, Pocket Beagle design. But he added, it, he added in the IO he needed, he added in a uh, gigabit ethernet, um, USB and like five volt power. So kind of the cool thing there is like taking the design and modifying it for his use case. We also just uh, launched a new board, which I'm excited about, called the uh, BeagleBone AI. Yeah, one of the nice things about it is it has a, a gigabit ethernet now, it has dual core ARM, has a whole bunch of different uh, coprocessors, including DSPs. Um, I'll be around if you want to take a look at it more. Um, the other thing that it has is it has these embedded vision engines so it can accelerate running uh, TensorFlow light models on it, so some kind of some new options there for doing uh, uh, machine learning and uh, self-driving robots and things like that. And one of the things that we did with this when we launched it was we registered it as a open source as a certified open source hardware project. So it's uh, registered as US00169. So if you go look up in the um, certified open source hardware database, you'll find the link to the design files. So you can go find the design files there on GitHub. So uh, one of the other boards, uh, one of the other community boards that I really liked at the time uh, was the Minnow board, which was a 64-bit uh, Intel Atom board um, that Intel kind of kicked off. Um, and the, the most recent one um, had USB 3.0, SATA, PCI Express, Gigabit Ethernet. Um, and the other great thing was it had Intel uh, graphics, so it had open source mainline uh, Linux drivers for it, um, for the graphics. Um, one of the unfortunate in the other thing here is you can actually you can download the schematics, the board layout, bill of materials. Um, it was released under a Creative Commons license. Uh, the one unfortunate thing is it doesn't look like there's any feature uh, for this. Uh, it's still being manufactured, I think, by ADI, and it's sold by NetGate, but it doesn't look like it's gonna, I don't think we're gonna see like a Minnow Board 3, unfortunately. One of the other companies that's doing a lot of great stuff with open source hardware is uh, Alimex, and they're based on Bulgaria. Um, and they have a line of uh, low cost open source hardware Linux computers called the uh, Olinux We Know. Uh, and there's a great blog post from the founder of the company, uh, Svetin, where he talks about 
open source hardware and uh, why it matters to them as a company. And one of the boards that they designed recently was this um, A64 O Linux we know. So the nice thing about this is it's designed in KiCad, which is free software. So this is an open source hardware board that you can run Linux on that was designed in uh, free software. Uh, how many people have heard of uh, KiCad or KiCad before? Okay, most of you, awesome. So um, Svetin from uh, Alimex gave a talk about the design of this board and how they decided to at the time, which back in 2016, I don't think too many people had done like a 64-bit ARM board in uh, KiCad yet. So uh, he talks about uh, their process they went through for that in this uh, FOSDEM talk. So most of you said you had heard of KiCad, but for those of you that haven't, um, it's a open source free software um, EDA suite for um, doing circuit board design. So you can do your schematics in it, you can do your circuit board layout in it, and it's cross-platform. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, one of the great things about it, and it kind of reminds me of maybe something like Linux, where like for a long time it was only something that like kind of a small niche group of people used, and over the last few years it's really exploded in uh, the number of people using it. Part of that is Sir now has developers working on it. Um, also, the project leader, Wayne, just got hired full-time to work on it. So for most of the project's existence, it was just all volunteers. So now the project leader, is Wayne, is uh, employed full-time to work on it. So I think we're going to see a lot of uh, great things coming from KiCad in uh, the next year or two. Um, if you've not designed a PCB or you've not used KiCad before, one of the great ways to learn it is there's a tutorial series on YouTube called Getting to Blinky. So if you get the slides, you can click on that link or just search for uh, Getting to Blinky on uh, YouTube. So one of the things that Alimex did was they wanted to make their own uh, open source hardware laptop. Um, and they uh, used that uh, all winter A64 board um, that they designed in KiCad to build this laptop. So you can, you can check out uh, the links there if you want to find out more about it. Um, so it was an interesting idea of uh, kind of their criticism of the uh, Novino, which I showed you in, in the beginning, was it was very much meant for people that wanted to do hardware hacking. And Svetin wanted to make one that was more targeted towards um, general users. a very limited uh, DRAM bandwidth, I believe, compared to Novena, which is much wider DRAM bus. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, for high resolution graphics, could be a problem. Yeah, yeah, it was from a few years ago. Um, there, there is like kind of a common trend of people making different open source hardware laptop designs, so um, it'd be interesting to see if they follow it up with something that's maybe more powerful. There is an IMX uh, 8M coming one. Uh, okay. coming up, so uh, that might be an option. Maybe, maybe we'll find out something at FOSDEM this year. Uh, so one of the other um, open hardware uh, boards um, that I think maybe a lot of people saw a few years ago was called the Chip Computer, and they, they built it as the $9 computer. Um, they did a very successful Kickstarter in 2015. Um, unfortunately, the company uh, ended in 2018. Um, but one of, the, one of the cool things about it was because all the designs were open hardware, um, it, it still continues to exist. So um, the schematics, the PCB layout, and the board of materials were all released under an open source license. And one of the cool things about that is um, someone from the community, he goes by Gurgard on t Twitter, his name is Christopher Alessandro, is, um, well, if you go back to this picture, probably the coolest thing that, um, Nextinko did with the chip was they made this thing called the pocket chip, which is a super cool, like, kind of handheld Linux computer. Um, and while the chip computer doesn't exist anymore, um, uh, Grogar decided to make his own uh, new module that would plug into the pocket chip called the Nebula One. Um, so if you're interested, you can go click on that link and you can see him running Doom on it. So I, I like the idea of it was like, you know, the company unfortunately didn't work out, but the designs were all open, so he was able to make his own module that plugged into it. 
And then he ended up uh, going on and making a pretty cool board earlier this year. So um, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but in the microcontroller world, one of the popular form factors nowadays is the Adafruit Feather form factor. Um, so it's being used by uh, companies like Particle for their boards, but it's basically a new uh, form factor for expansion boards. So you have your base board with the microcontroller, and then you have other things that stack up to add functionality. So um, this is a lit full Linux computer in that small uh, feather form factor um, that he designed. Um, and it funded on Crowd Supply uh, a couple months ago. So that's a, a new open source hardware board that will be coming out that you can run Linux on. It's a, it's a uh, I think it's a Cortex uh, A7. It's the Atmel uh, uh, Sam, A5, Sam A5, so it's like a medium performance one, but it is good enough to play Doom on. And it's in a really far, small form factor. It's hard to show you here, but um, it, it is interesting that he's able to fit that into a small form factor. Uh, one of the other um, kind of open hardware uh, laptop computer projects was this project called the EOMA uh, 68, um, which their idea was um, to use the old PCM CIA slot uh, standard. And um, so the, the idea behind this was, okay, you have your laptop and new processor comes out. Uh, you don't want to throw out the laptop, so you would have processor card in, you know, these, the old uh, PCM CIA slots, and then you would plug in, you know, Okay, I've got a new processor module, I'll plug that in. So this is something I ended up manufacturing. There's a component on, on crowd supply for it. Um, so the idea there is, you know, that you still like the display, but there's a new SOC that came out, so you can just plug in the new SOC. So one of the things that I am very interested to find out is I don't know everything that's out there. Um, so I would very much like to know uh, later on or in the questions if you know of other uh, open source hardware boards that are capable of uh, running Linux. And maybe one of the things we could do is create a list on like the eLinux wiki to better keep track of this. I also have an ask on Twitter, uh, which actually was quite great because I got a lot of wonderful responses. So one of the ones that I found out was the, um, the Sci-Fi, or Sci-Fi is a, is a startup and they have a uh, RISC-V based board called the Hi-5 Unleashed, which is a, has a 64-bit RISC-V processor, and that's a completely open source hardware board. Uh, there's also a smaller one I found out about called the Vocore, which is also open source hardware. Um, and then one of the more exciting categories is there is um, the Lattice ECP5 FPGA that is uh, capable enough of uh, running a soft RISC-V core that can run Linux. And there's several people that are working on uh, open source hardware boards. Um, there's a uh, hackerspace in Croatia, Radio now that has one out. Uh, there's Orange Crab by Greg DeVille. Uh, David Shaw, who's the person that did the reverse engineering to be able to have a free software tool chain for that FPGA, also has a board that's coming out. So um, it's kind of exciting that there's uh, a bunch of different open hardware boards that are coming out that can, with a uh, soft RISC-V core, run Linux. So. In the questions, I'll be interested to know if, you, if anyone has any other boards that they know of. So one of the things that um, I gave, a, I did a Birds of a Feller at ELC a few years ago, um, and uh, when I was talking about it, one of the things I was wondering, there's a bunch of boards on 96boards.org. I don't know how many of you have seen 96boards.org, but it's an um, initiative from Leonardo to, 96 is 32, but plus 64 bits, so it has both microcontroller boards and 64 bit boards on there. Um, but looking at this, I went and looked and none of the designs actually seemed to be open source hardware. I couldn't find the design files for the boards. So to me, this seemed like a, um, a missing opportunity because most of the boards you know, are from the silicon SOC vendors and I, w I would think that they would want the these things to act as reference designs for those SOCs. So um, maybe there's some opportunity there. I don't know. I talked to some people that were involved in it, and they said one of the big problems was, well, releasing the files. Oh, I don't know I, who I'd have to go through within my company to go through legal and stuff like that. I know in the case of like Texas Instruments, when Beagle first started, was like they had to set up like an open source review board for that. 
I know talking to people at Intel, they had to set up similar sort of review process for getting things like the minnow board out. So maybe those things don't exist at some of these other companies yet. The other thing too is 96 boards, the point of it was not to be an open source hardware reference, it was to be uh, kind of to standardize um, on the form factor uh, for people making these um, different uh, dev boards for new SOCs. So they kind of, that was not their goal, but in my opinion, I think that they could be benefited by having some of those boards be open hardware. They do have a add-on standard called the mezzanine standard, and some of those, which are basically expansion boards that go on top, some of those are open source hardware. And there's just some other, um, other boards that I looked at, um, like the UDO, um, and I was unable to find like the design files for it. Doesn't mean that they aren't out there. One of the things that I, when I go and look in research boards, sometimes it's hard to figure out, you know, I'll email the companies, I'll go to their websites, end up like on an FTP server, and sometimes I don't know if they're, I'm just not finding them or if they're not there, so. A couple of boards that I looked at that I wasn't able to find the design files, but um, I could be wrong. So the other thing I'm hoping, if I am wrong or people know where the design files are, um, it would be great to, to get a list of that. So one of the things that I think is very exciting is what's happening with uh, what I'm calling Libre Silicon, open source silicon. So there's a lot of great things happening now. Um, primarily because of RISC-V. How many people have heard of RISC-V? Okay, almost everyone in the room. That's great. So it is an um, uh, open architecture that came out of Berkeley um, from some of the people that originally created RISC back in the day. Um, and it has both 32-bit and 64-bit um, uh, versions of the instruction set. So one of the first ways I became, no, I knew about it was um, I saw this uh, group from a university in Columbia had made their own microcontroller and they had just uh, wire bonded it to a circuit board um, and their goal was to make a completely open source 32-bit um, microcontroller uh, and the name of their group was OnChip. And they wanted to do it like at a very low level, they wanted to do their own like transistor cells and everything which was I think um, quite an ambitious uh, goal for their project. Um, so I just put that in there for people that are interested in, like how you, if you actually want to make so, like completely open chip, like what the work that you have to go through to do these things that you normally license from the fab. Um, so there's still, there, I mean they're a research project out of the university, so they're still working on this, but um, if, if you have interest in like how you actually would do it at the full, lowest levels, that's a good thing to look at. Um, one of the other groups I'm very excited about is low risk. So a couple of people that were, uh, helped start the Raspberry Pi um, went and then created Low Risk. And the mission of Low Risk is to create a fully open source, Linux case capable Risk v SOC that can be used as the basis for a custom design. Um, so I've heard a couple of the founders talk about, you know, like for example, maybe in a few years you could use one of these to like run something like a smartphone. Um, so that's something I find very exciting. Uh, and. Uh, there's a talk from the, one, of the, one of the founders of it, Rob Mullins, where he describes their, um, their vision for it. One of the other interesting things about it is they are a uh, charity in the UK, so they're doing this um, kind of as a different model than a, than a for-profit startup. There's also the Fozzy Foundation, which is the free and open source Silicon Foundation, which is an organization that's been kind of an umbrella to bring together a lot of different people out there that are doing different uh, uh, open source and Libre silicon efforts. So there's different events throughout the year and Fozzie's kind of the, the organization that helps organize those now. Um, if you're interested more about this, there's a video from the co-founder of Fozzie, um, Julius Baxter, where he talks about uh, their vision for open source silicon design. And one of the things they've done is they set up a website um, called LibreCores. Um, and this is supposed to be a way of sharing um, uh, digital designs, um, uh, silicon IP, or things that you would either uh, put onto an FPGA or maybe even go through and create an ASIC or an IC with it. Um, and this is something that's replaced open cores, um, which I think was mentioned earlier. Um, the maintainership of open cores kind of went away, so Libre Cores is the site that's kind of replaced that now. 
Uh, one of the things, and I don't think I have a slide about this, but one of the big challenges with this is, okay, you find like, um, you know, an I2C controller on Libre course, how do you validate it? And a lot of the efforts right now in this kind of Libre Silicon um, community is around verification. So like one of the big things Low Risk is working on right now is how to do verification. Um, the people that did the um, free software tool chains for some of the FPGAs, they're very focused on verification. Um, unlike software, you know, where we can compile it and do some tests, like if you were to go through and fab a chip with, um, you know, some open IP that you got for a USB controller, um, you need to have a way to verify that that works um, before you were to tape that out and, and make a chip based on it. Um, it's a little, little less serious if you're doing an FPGA, but in terms of actually making chips based around open, um, open designs, you, you need to have a way of doing verification. So that's kind of like the big um, challenge right now in this, in this community is verification. Um, one of the recent conferences this year was LatchUp in, uh, in the US. Um, there's all the videos from it are online if you want to check those out and learn more about what's going on with uh, open source silicon design. There was also the week of open source hardware um, in Zurich back in June. Um, so there was a bunch of different talks there as well. So there's only been a few companies so far that have actually like produced uh, uh, RISC-V um, chips, um, hard silicon. A lot of the research is going on right now, people are doing on FPGAs. Um, but Sci-5 is a startup that has actually um, produced a couple different uh, RISC-V based chips. Um, one of which is the, um, well, if you want to kind of get an overview of what they're trying to go for, there was a talk um, at ELC a few years ago, or last year, um, from uh, the co-founder and CTO. Um, and this was their first chip. It's a microcontroller chip, so it's not capable of running Linux, but something that could potentially replace, you know, an Atmel or uh, Atmel microcontroller or some kind of low bit, uh, low end 32-bit uh, microcontroller. Uh, and then this was their development board. And then uh, Michael Welling, who's the person that designed this little penguin badge here, uh, he created a, a low cost version called the Low 5. So if you had interest in playing around with this uh, Sci-5, uh, Risk 5 um, microcontroller, you can get the, the Low 5 dev board. Um, and then kind of the really exciting thing f for me last year at FOSDEM, um, Palmer uh, Deblet from Sci-5 gave a talk where they announced their 64-bit chip. So the fact that they had made a 64-bit Risk 5 um, chip that is capable of running uh, Linux. And they have their uh, reference board called the Hi5 Unleashed. Um, so this is a pretty powerful board. Uh, it can run uh, Linux on 64-bit uh, uh, Risk 5. One of the downsides to this is it's a pretty expensive board. It's about $1,000. And the reason for that is Sci5 is not really in the business of making chips. So their main model is they want to uh, work with other companies that are actually going to then produce the chips. So. Um, uh, just talking a few weeks ago with, with Palmer from Sci-5, it's like my hope was, oh, maybe this board will go down in price. It seems like the case will be um, there'll be, even be other companies that will produce chips based on that um, design, and that's maybe how we'll eventually find, you know, lower cost, higher quantity, 64-bit uh, uh, RISC-V processors. So one of the things I really hope uh, we can get to is a RISC-V-based 64-bit board that can run uh, Linux. So an open source hardware, RISC-V, 64-bit Linux board uh, for less than $100. So I don't know how crazy that is. Um, I think it's going to take, we're going to have to get to the point where there's a company that's making 64-bit uh, RISC-V SOCs in like large quantity um, for the prices to come down. Um, I don't think it's going to be Sci-5, but it might be a customer of Sci-5. Um, so this is something I'm very interested in. Uh, and if anyone else is interested in, in it, uh, I'd love to maybe set up a mailing list or something like that, see if we can get something going. So, uh, so yeah, the, the main thing that I was also hoping to spark in this discussion was um, if there are other projects that I've overlooked that are open source hardware that are capable of running Linux, um, or if there's other interesting, like, uh, open source silicon projects that um, we could potentially be running Linux on. 
Um, so I don't know if we have any time for questions, but well, that's my, I guess we, well, that's 40 minutes. So I don't know if we have any extra time, but um, we could throw around the cube. What's that? We should do questions? OK. Are there any questions? OK. Um, so my, my interest in the list would not be that it is like complete, but also showing like the, uh, if that is still active, the project is still active. Yeah. My, so I'm just interested in, in buying and using such hardware, and I found the Beagle logic. Uh, but at that time when I looked, it was like, okay, I have it done and you have the schematic, so uh, you're on your own, but I'm not in the position to do produce it on my own. So yeah. is there some infrastructure where I can sign up like, okay, I'm interested in the hardware and if there's a bunch of people interested and somebody is saying, okay, I'll do it and make some money out of there, it? There is, I mean, there are a couple of companies that have websites based around that, like the um, Blow5 board that I showed there. Um, that was available through a company called GroupGets. And the idea behind GroupGets was like, um, if you get enough people that want to get the board, then then the board gets made. Um, it's kind of a bit of a, a take on crowdfunding. Um, so like for this one, I don't know, it was like you had to get 100 orders, and then that would be enough to get it manufactured. Um, but I think also to your point, for the for like a list of boards, it, it's important to show whether or not they're being actively produced. Um, because it's, yes, it's nice, okay, there's the open source hardware design files, but then there's also like, is it still actually actively being manufactured? Um, and there's boards like the Minnow board where like they're, they've kind of gone away from, you know, being like actively produced. So, yeah, I think. For, for, for a user, it's a bit mean what you could have, but you can't. So it's yes, like yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I think it has to, it's both like, are the design files available and is it currently in production, right? That would be good things to know. Just a small comment, uh, there is the VexRisk 5 core which can run Linux and you can synthesize it for the ECP5. Yes. I'm not sure you mentioned that. Yeah, I, I didn't do like a great job at highlighting that, um, but uh, back here, uh, there's, okay, so this probably deserves like several slides of its own, but this is very exciting because, so um, Lattice is a company that makes FPGAs, and they have the ICE-40, which, which was reverse engineered by Clifford Wolf and some other people. So you can use free software tools instead of the proprietary tools. And then more recently, um, the more powerful ECP-5, which is something of capable of doing things like USB-3 and um, like high-speed data buses and things like that, and having enough space to have um, like the VEX uh, um, RISC-V core that can capable of run Linux running on it. So it's basically a much more powerful FPGA. And David Shaw, um, through Project Trellis, got reverse engineered it and got a uh, free software tool chain working for it. So you can take one of these ECP5 boards and using free software, um, put a soft RISC-V core onto it. Um, and the first board that I saw came out with it was from Radiona. Um, and then there are several other people that are starting to produce boards. Um, I should say, like, they're, they're not super fast. Like, we're maybe, like, talking about a couple hundred megahertz because it's a soft core. Um, and the, the RAM is, is SD RAM. It's not DDR yet, uh, most of them. So uh, it's, like, kind of limited. It's, we're, we're talking about, like, 64 megabytes or 128 megabytes. Um, I think the, the David Shaw's board, the ultimate board, might have more. But um, that's one of the problems with FPGAs is, is the dev boards can get kind of expensive, um, which is why I'm hoping more companies will tape out um, RISC V chips and make them available. Oh. Thank you. Uh, is, in terms of the open hardware license, mm -hmm. um, it appears from my understanding that it only covers the design of the board and there's no expectation that the firmware or bootloader or anything then to to then uh, power the board yeah boot the board um, needs to be published is, is that correct yeah so they're kind of separate things so the open source hardware definition is really just talking about the design of the of the hardware um, in the best practices we say like it would be good to have like the entire system be open um, 
There's, there's a separate initiative from the Free Software Foundation, which is uh, Respects Your Freedom, uh, which is where all the software and firmware parts of the system need to be um, free software. Um, so there's, there's like a few products that cross over that are both open source hardware and considered by the Free Software Foundation to be Respects Your Freedom. So, and there's other boards which are, are not open source hardware, but um, have done a really good job at upstreaming all of the support for the firmware and the software, right? So um, it depends on the use case, right? You know, um, you know, some people don't care much about the hardware design and just want to know that the board has like, you know, it can run like, um, for example, um, one of the things on the Free Software Foundation's Respects Your Freedom list is these routers that you can get um, that have um, free software firmware. And they're all like based on like proprietary like D-Links or something where they've reflashed them. Uh, it's uh, Think Penguin, I think, I've ordered like all my Wi-Fi stuff from. So that's an example of something where like, it's proprietary hardware, but it's been repurposed to have like free software firmware on it and uh, free software like uh, Linux running on it. So uh, yeah, the, the, but the open source hardware licenses themselves don't really talk about the software. Um, the one thing they talk about is the fact that um, it's okay to use proprietary software to, to do your hardware design, though it, the best practice would be not to. But until recently, like only the last couple of years, like KiCad got good enough to do advanced design. So there's kind of been some tools that have been lacking. Um, there's also a lot of people that kind of hate free CAD. So, um, and there's people, a lot of people who are using Fusion for doing mechanical design and you know, free CAD still has maybe a ways to go in terms of adoption, so. Um, and I had a second question then about the trademark of the name. So Beagle, Beagle Boards, um, anyone can make a board and then put the name Beagle Board. Yes. Uh, use yeah. the name Beagle Board in their name of the board. And why, why was that possible? And why not with Arduino, for example? I know Arduino had issues with their name and, Ar and uh, the genuine. Gen yeah. Um, so I mean, one of, the, one of the best practices with open hardware, if you want to control your brand, is to trademark, um, so with like BeagleBoard.org, that's trademarked, the little dog logo is trademarked. Um, so the, what we do is anyone that wants to can go along and, and make a BeagleBone. There's lots of companies that are just making BeagleBones to embed it to projects, um, and they're not like officially BeagleBoard.org boards. And then we also work with different manufacturers where we license the, the official branding and the logo to them to use. Um, so it's kind of up to people, up to people that are making them if they want to use it or not. Um, it isn't very important when you do this, um, and that's why I pointed to that talk earlier about, um, at the back at the beginning about licensing, um, because um, Ari explains it much better than me. Um, it's very important if you're gonna do something, especially a product, to uh, have control over your, like, your brand. Um, you're releasing the design files for free, or you're releasing the design files as open source, which means other people can make it, but um, it's important that you probably want to control your brand. Um, and you can do that through like trademark and copyright. Arduino is unfortunately a bad example of where internally there was, um, internally within the organizations, different people decided to do different things. So it got kind of messy. Um, but ideally like if you know, if you were doing like Lucas board, you would like trademark Lucas board and then you know, you, you would then, you know, only if it was like an official Lucas Borg, it would have your branding, and then other ones, you know, wouldn't be allowed to use that, you know, legally. You didn't mention MIPS. That's now open source too. I understand. I think they they have opened up their instructions that uh, I think. And they maybe. have cores. I saw. I'm checking the yeah. website right, right now. Um, yeah, so maybe MIPS is something I should include in there. I know um, Power recently did something as well where they opened up some stuff. Um, so um, I think those things are probably most applicable to people that are working with FPGAs and they could take those cores and put them onto FPGAs. Um, the um, the VO core, which I did mention, was a little Linux computer. That, I think, does have a, a MIPS core in it. But um, yeah, RISC-V is not the only thing. It's just a very popular thing right now. Actually, MediaTek, but I don't know what the core is. I mean, it's a MediaTek processor, but I don't know.
French, yeah. So there is some sort of academic uh, MIPS which is open and even to the HDL, but uh, I believe this is only available to university students. It's not generally available. Okay. And there is still some licensing something attached to it. Um. Yeah, I mean, like, well, Risk Five is not the only thing out there. Um, and in fact, I interestingly, like the the biggest conference actually is happening this weekend. It's called OrConf. So for people that are doing open source silicon design, OrConf has been going on for many years. It stands for Open Risk, but now like most of the content at OrConf is actually Risk Five based research. So um, actually, if anyone wants to, it's in Bordeaux this weekend. So if you want to head down there and learn all about like. Libre silicon in open source like chip design. You could you could do that after uh, after this conference. All right. I guess that is means it's time for lunch. <laughs>